Okay, so, Ilya, I've heard a little bit about you. Uh, I read online what I could find and I found so many amazing stuff. So, you were born in Russia, That's correct. raised in Israel, Germany, and then UK, no, uh, New US. York, New York City. New York City, yeah. You did a PhD in applied physics. That's correct. Yeah, and you started your own company in solar cells. Yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, you've been an entrepreneur and then you started working for a VC firm mm -hmm. and then joined Dropbox. So. A long story short, what made you uh, decide to go first from the VC world to Dropbox as an employee? Yeah, so um, by the way, how many of you guys are entrepreneurs? Awesome. How many of you are aspiring entrepreneurs? That's the rest of you, all right. <laughs> That's good. Um, so I, I, I've been really privileged to have had this uh, very diverse uh, kind of career and um, see different parts of the world and learn different things. And um, it was really by chance that I, I landed in venture capital in the first place. Um, the startup I did with a bunch of uh, friends from PhD uh, was building solar cells. And we, we actually built the world's most efficient solar cell. It was also the world's most expensive solar cell. So our business was really terrible, <laughs> but the science was but really but awesome. It, it always starts by being expensive, right? Yeah. I mean, before it was really expensive. Oh, okay. Anyway, the company, <laughs> the company got acquired for, for military and satellite applications where um, cost didn't really matter, but efficiency did. And I sort of was doing a bit of uh, soul searching. I had written a bunch of software to help us run the fabrication facility and, and sort of analyze data. Uh, and in that process, I was talking to a bunch of VCs to figure out, you know, maybe they could finance my, my data idea. Uh, and I ran into one firm called Kosla Ventures. I started by this guy, Vinod Kosla, who was a great venture capitalist. Uh, and they told me that my idea was sucked, it was terrible, uh, but I should join them. Uh, and for me, that was a really interesting mo moment because I had sort of been on the science uh, and building side, but I never really fully understood the business side. Uh, and so I thought, you know, I could either go to business school or I could do this. And being in venture seemed a lot more fun and, and pretty cool, so I just decided to do that. Uh, and it was really fun. Uh, it was really fun to see lots of different ideas, meet lots of different entrepreneurs, see how companies developed. And you know, Solar Junction, which was the company that I did, went from about five people to 50 people, and that's where we kind of tapped out. And I felt that I had uh, been helpful to companies that were small, so I could tell them what to do when there were five to 50 people. But beyond that, I was kind of inventing things, right? Um, and so I wanted to figure out a way to be helpful to those companies because long term, I wanted to be in venture. But I also wanted to build something meaningful. And um, I had happened to know the people at Dropbox socially. They were my friends and I spent a bunch of time with them. I was talking to them about some ideas I had about building things. And they, like the VC folks before, said, your ideas suck, but you should join us. And so... Uh, so you, you, as a VC, you met them? Yeah. And you didn't choose to invest? Well, I was trying to invest, and then uh, they were so expensive that the firm that I was at said, no way, and uh, I decided to invest with my personal capital. Okay. My, my co-founder, uh, yes, like on Saturday, we give lessons here on stage for future employees of startups, and he often says that actually investors and employees have much more in common than investors and founders. Why? Because in both cases, you invest... Uh, as a money or time, but you invest something, right? And so you, you've been from investment to investing with the most precious, your time, into Dropbox. And what was the trigger? Like, what made you believe, okay, I want to join these guys? Well, um, at the time, Dropbox was about 50 people, uh, and it had 25 million users and $30 million in revenue. Um, so it was sort of a business that you wouldn't find anywhere else. It was very magical, and it was growing like a hockey stick. Um, so it was sort of a no-brainer to join. Uh, the only issue for me at the time was that there wasn't a very clearly defined role. Uh, and so I became the uh, head of corporate development. I was the corporate development team. So selling the product? No, actually it was uh, everything from building product to partnering to acquiring companies everything. And then over time, uh, my role migrated into a product role. I built uh, the business product, Dropbox for Business. I built a bunch of other products and wound up taking on responsibility over all of product. Okay. Uh, but it was a magical company. It was a great team. It was a f really fantastic team. 
uh, and it was a, a no-brainer opportunity to jump in. Yeah, so when you arrived, there were 50. When you left, there were 1,500? 1,500, yeah. Okay, so you've seen the growth step by step. And, and how does it look to, to lead the, the product team of Dropbox? I mean, the first product team that you remember was totally different from the product team that you left. Yeah, absolutely. Well, when I joined, there was one person on the product team, 18 engineers, one and a half designers, um, lots of support folks because we really cared about customer support, um, and, and, you know, lots to do. The biggest thing, you know, in companies when you hit this hyper growth, so just to put it in context, is from 50 to 1,500 in four years, right? So you're really growing fast. Um, every three to six months, everything breaks, really. You have to re-engineer all of your processes, the structure of the organization, how you build things, how you communicate. Um, you really have to rethink all of that very quickly. And at the same time, you have to bring in people who've hopefully seen that before. Yeah. Um, so the product organization evolved dramatically pretty much like every organization. Yeah, I, I remember, I mean, as a consumer, uh, as a client, uh, we felt it when you designed the offer for businesses. Uh, I mean, it was really cool for us because we were all on separate accounts on the same card and it was a, a nightmare. Uh, we are like strong users of uh, Dropbox for thank business. You. Yeah, no, it's not thank you. It's just a very useful product, right? Um, so the, the, the first team, you had barely uh, uh, not so much diversity in the team. And like in terms of uh, only engineers, heavily tech. And now you would say how it has changed. Like, Well, the, you know, the, the way you, you sort of build the company typically, um, and for all of you who are maybe part of small companies, it's, it's easiest to hire people like yourself, right? Because you can relate to them, you know how to interview them, you know how they think. And you want to hire people who can pretty much do everything, yeah. right? So you want to have a small team. The jack of all trades. Jack of all trades who are going to get in there and they're going to, uh, you know, do whatever it takes. It's sort of... Uh, there's Not specialized. An, yeah, there's an analogy out there. It's like, you know, storming, a, like an army storming a beach. Right. First, you send in the, the paratroopers who are like in their little rubber boat. They get in there under the cover of darkness. They do everything. Once you've taken a little bit of the beach, you get in the people who built some infrastructure. Once you take over but part of that... But do you keep the pioneers? So you, you, you try to keep the pioneers. I mean, when you're growing this fast, yeah. um, it's all about people's ability to learn. Right? The folks who are truly exceptional and the folks who stay on are the, are the fast learners. Now, sometimes for certain roles, like maybe it's sales, uh, it's impossible to get five or six years of knowledge in six months. It's just a, a trade that you have to be part of. So that's why you want to, at the right time, bring in the right folks. You don't want to be, do it too soon, but you don't want to wait too long. So to answer your first question, um, once we became, let's say, 100 or 150 people, we started to specialize. Uh, we started to bring in people who were maybe amazing, even in engineering, amazing at building mobile applications, but maybe not so good at building server-side um, infrastructure. Uh, we started bringing in people who were maybe amazing at designing web, uh, but weren't so great at, at mobile. They were tr still truly exceptional in what they did. I think the, the one thing that um, I think Dropbox did exceptionally well was keep a super high bar of talent. And I would urge all of you as you're building companies to never compromise on talent because it's a downward spiral. Um, so you want to bring in people who are really excellent at what they do, but they're just specialized. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not about luck, it's about work, but uh, honestly, Dropbox have been really like triggered by the growth and, and, and so it's, easy in a way uh, to attract the right people when you are a good team growing, made by tech people, for tech people, in the Silicon Valley. I mean, um, attracting talent in that specific context, didn't you feel like it was a kind of easy? Uh, it was both easy and hard because part of it, you know, at the earlier side, when we were kind of around 50 to 100 people, we were still in this mindset of wanting to bring in people who were like us. And that doesn't really scale. You have to really change your mindset to figure out who is the, who is the set of right people you want to bring in. It's also true that at some point when you become super successful, everybody wants to work at your company. So you have to filter a little bit harder. 
um, because sometimes you know they're not motivated by by the same thing. So uh, hiring, I think, is is an art, and I think it's uh, you know, kudos to to the founders, but they were really involved in pretty much every interview at the company through about 300 people yeah. or 400 people, which is you know, really dedication if you think about the number of interviews you have to do every day. Yeah. But, but that's interesting because you say at the beginning you attract the burn head, I mean the crazy ones, the pioneers, and then you need some more uh, specialized ones, but still you don't want them to be attracted by the hype, but in a m I mean, it's kind of contradictory, no? I mean, they are obviously attracted by the hype. Of course. Well, I think you, you can mitigate that. And one thing that I see, uh, you know, when I work with companies, I see them do a lot is you'll put up a resume on the website and you say, I want to hire a person <laughs> to do something, right? Um, and you'll get a bunch of resumes, but they're probably not going to be so good. So you have to be a little bit strategic about how you do that. If you're building a, a product that, let's say, you know, there are people at um, Netflix that are really good at doing what you want to do, then you know you got to target those people, and so you have to sort of become very strategic about how you go after talent. Just wishing mm -hmm. that something comes inbound is, is so. So part of your job was to acquire startups, and basically it was hack or hire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and how did you integrate these teams into your core team, your product team? So um, we actually got really lucky on the product side because uh, one thing that I realized pretty early was that the people who made some of the best product managers for our stage of company were people who had done product at a big company. So maybe for us it was a Google or a Facebook or a Microsoft, um, but then had become entrepreneurial. So they yeah. went and they did a startup themselves. And in the best case, they failed. Mm. Because if they'd failed, they would figured out that resources are very finite, that building an early stage company, you have to be super scrappy. And they were willing to really come in and, and do the hard work. And those folks were really phenomenal product managers because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, I think most product folks should think of themselves and should be thought of as CEOs of the product. And mm -hmm. there's no better fit than having the CEO of a company come in and, and be the CEO of your product. Mm. And uh, do you, how did you choose uh, the startup that you acquire at the time? Uh, it's a mix. So, I mean, many of you will start companies and at some point you'll talk to a bunch of investors and Hopefully they'll say yes, but at some point they'll say no. <laughs> and then you'll say, shit, what am I going to do? Uh, and then you, your investors will say, well, you know what? I, maybe I know somebody at this company X, a company Y or company Z. Uh, maybe you should go talk to them. And that's one avenue. Another avenue is um, maybe you've built something that um, is really interesting and really valuable. For us, that was um, a product called Mailbox. We, we were really interested yeah. in communication. Mm -hmm. They built a great product. We said, look, you know, these are the kinds of people we want to bring into our organization to help us move faster. Um, so it, it can be both kind of inbound and outbound, but at the end of the day, a lot of that work is, is really just connecting with the startup community. So um, one thing I will say is a, lo a lot of companies I talk to sometimes hesitate to connect with corporates. Um, and I don't think you have to. You don't have to tell them everything that you're doing, obviously. But it's good to have these relationships, um, both for, obviously, outcomes, but also maybe investments and, and partnerships. Let's talk a little bit about the culture at Dropbox. Um, how would you describe it? How important was it? How you get into it? How they onboard new employees? So culture was really critical. In fact, we had um, a really fantastic um, guy uh, named John Ying, uh, who was, um, I guess he was the first designer. He was employee number three or four at Dropbox. Uh, and he became kind of the owner of culture. Uh, and he did, uh, he treated culture like brand. So he came up with the design language, because he was a designer. Uh, he would make these uh, cool presentations. He would run all hands. Um, he would basically infuse culture into everything to a point where, in fact, one of our company, when we th thought about company values, as many of you will at some point, Think about it's things like move fast, break things, or mm -hmm. don't break things, uh, or be aggressive, or not be non-aggressive. Hopefully, uh, when yeah, unless you have to. Um, but um, one of the company values that he came up with uh, was a, a drawing of a cupcake. <laughs> um, and the the reason for that was that if you think about the product we were building, um, it was helping people synchronize files, synchronize and send files across devices. So other products that help you do that are like USB sticks and network attached storage. These are not kind of awesome, beautiful, fun human experiences. But we, we knew that 
our edge in terms of beating the competition and growing quickly was to design beautiful, great end user experiences. And so we wanted to infuse that uh, notion of end user delight into our culture. Uh, and Cupcake was meant to do that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, culture is paramount. And culture, I, mean, I think you know, you've, you've obviously seen some, some news about um, you know, um, Uber uh, recently, and you've seen kind of, you know, there's a lot, if you read the tech press, if companies go through these cycles. Um, if you've built the right culture, that's the only way that you're gonna retain the best talent through ups and downs. And pretty much every company is gonna go through ups and downs. I mean, when you look at company growth curves, even if you look at Dropboxes, it looks like a exponential curve, whether it's revenue or users or whatnot. But when you zoom in, it's, it's steps, right? And when sometimes when the steps are long and slow, uh, people get a little antsy and they start worrying about the future. Uh, and so the only real way to, to manage that is by having built a culture where people are really tied and, and connected to your goals as a company um, and are really, they feel like they're part of the company. Yeah, there is something special about Dropbox. I mean, we feel this mix of talents, like design is really important and they make a boring, a boring product, you know, it's about a uh, file, or it's replacing the USB key, basically, uh, smarter. Um, but they put design at the right place, like this cupcake story, it, it changed a lot. And uh, for me, Dropbox are the one who made something B2B become as sexy as a B2C and actually became the B2C or even the model B2C2B. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this is the, the, the well, thing at Dropbox. The, the big, yeah, the big thing was, um, we, and we always had this sort of split brain behavior because ultimately the product started on the consumer side. Um, but, you know, all consumers go to work at some point yeah. in their life. Uh, and we had a very disjoint experience. It was kind of like you had all these awesome applications in your personal life, whether it was Dropbox or Facebook or Spotify or you know, uh, Snapchat, um, but then when you went to work, it was kind of this real shit that you had to deal with where yeah. it's kind of hard to do it, you, you know, outlook with like folders and flags and things like that. And so um, we realized that people started bringing our product with them to work because they just liked using it. And so for us, it was a no brainer to connect your work and, and personal, but it was logistically actually pretty hard to execute on because when you start building things for businesses, you have a whole different set of requirements. And not only is it a whole se separate list of requirements, but also culturally, you know, take telling an engineer, hey, do you want to work on like settings for admins or like cool, you know, sharing features for consumers? You, you kind of have to, again, through culture, yeah. get them really excited about that. Uh, so after four years, you left Dropbox. And it's hard, you know, because I put myself in the shoes of Index, for instance, if I were Index, like hiring, someone from my portfolio, you know, in a sense, it's like, am I betraying one of my startups by doing that? Like, how was the relationship between the uh, Dropbox and Index? I mean... Yeah, so, so I, I had known Index for a long time. So in 2011, um, so Index Ventures, how many of you guys know about Index Ventures? Okay, a lot of you. Um, we're, we're a venture capital firm. We have offices in Geneva, London, and San Francisco. It's 20 years old in Europe, it's six years old in uh, the States. Uh, and the office in the States is in San Francisco, and it opened in 2011. And in fact, the first investment that Index made there was to lead the Series B of Dropbox. So that's how I got to know Index pretty early on. And so, um, you know, different VC firms take different approaches. Ours is that we work very closely with not just the founders, but also the executive team and, and folks within companies, uh, because we feel like we can help the company along. Um, and so I had developed a relationship with my partners through that. So I'd already effectively worked with them for a long time. Um, and then, you know, at 1,500 people, um, or even just before that, you know, my job went from building and launching things to managing large amounts of people, which is really fun, but also really challenging. And something that, um, you know, I was like, I'm not sure this is my calling in life. Uh, and so I had... Uh, sort of decided that I want to do something else, and it was a long dialogue between me and, and the folks at Index, but ultimately I had already had this relationship where we effectively worked together. So it was a very easy decision. So you would say the pressure, the pressure is different between uh, being a VC or be, be being on the startup side? Oh, it's totally different job. So when you're building something, you're solely focused on one thing. You hopefully have a team, 
So you've you've and you like maybe you're the captain of the team and somebody's a forward and somebody is playing defense and somebody is go a goalie and you have these kind of very clear handoffs um, and you're just you're just all kind of driving towards one goal. Um, when you're a VC, it's like you're playing ten different games. Um, you're you're not even you're not even the coach. You're like the guy who talks to the coach. Um, so you can't really you know tell people what to do. Um, and so you have to kind of help people along by working with them hands-on. And what's the most interesting part of this job? Is it to um, select the most exciting startup? And if so, what are your crush, your personal crush? And or is it to coach? Actually, not to coach, but to accompany and, and to be to stay and to back uh, the founders you already. I think they're. I mean, the, to me, they're all, the reason I'm doing it is they're all rewarding. So if you look at my portfolio, there. I mean, I'm late stage. I'm an investor in Slack and Intercom. So those companies are. Uh, I'm sure some of you folks have heard about them. Um, mm. They're really exciting because they're pretty mature. You know, they're four hundred. Slack has a lot in common with Dropbox. Very, very much, yeah. So they're very mature. They're far along. To me, it's just like being kind of in, at Dropbox and, and reliving that. But on the other side, I'm an investor in early stage companies like uh, Nova Credit, which is doing credit for people who cross borders. And it started with three people, with um, them doing Y Combinator, um, mm -hmm. us doing this, leading the seed investment, and really hands-on working with them to build the product strategy, to execute, to help build the team. So y it, it's really, you know, you, you and can- And they came to you or you discovered them? Um, well, we- the way it works with Y Combinator is you figure out very through through various means who's in Y Combinator and then you try to meet them <laughs> before Y Combinator. <laughs> All right, thanks for the tips. Okay, and some some great discoveries recently. Some of the, your your crushes in investment, the latest investment you've done. Uh, yeah, what what have I done? What have I done lately? Yeah, <laughs> the question. Um, well, I recently backed an entrepreneur who's um, actually going after consumer health, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, taking a, a sort of approach where um, uh, he's helping people connect into groups uh, and actually change their behavior. Uh, very much like, I don't know if you know, a product called Weight Watchers, but built for the, for the modern age. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really cool because um, it just helps people become much more healthy. Yeah. Would you say that uh, Index was interested by a profile like you because you, you have the legit you know what? Uh, you've been through it. You you build products. You know how to sell. You know how hard it is. And also, you not only you have the legit, but the the, s the founders they feel they can trust you because you're not only here to to make a, uh, a return. Yeah, I think you know, building a building a venture capital firm is is really it's like building a company. Uh, and so I think what you want to do is you want to create that diversity of talent. So if you look across index. Um, I think we actually did a really good job of bringing in people who've been on the product and building side. Like uh, my partner Mike was uh, running the router and switch division at Cisco for uh, a, a decade. And, um, mm -hmm. He had 30 plus thousand people report to him. And then you have uh, folks like uh, Danny who've been more on the investment side, but have seen the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was um, working on the IPO of uh, Netscape. So, um, so I think we have a really interesting mix. And what we do is we actually work together on, on most opportunities where mm -hmm. somebody is primary but then you have a few secondaries uh, and so what that that helps us do is it helps us figure out um, you know what's the most important thing for this company today mm -hmm. but absolutely I mean I think w we, we do try to look for people and w as we build a team who have spent time in companies and startups because ultimately when you talk to VCs you want to make sure that you're speaking the same language and they're really excited about what you're building not just about uh, the return opportunity we we, we tend to err yeah. towards people like that. But Europe. So, I mean, Dropbox was doing a lot of business in Europe, right, after the US? Yeah, so Dropbox was really lucky because from day one, uh, well, not day one, but pretty early on, uh, about 70% of our, our users were international outside of North America. About half of that, half was of those were in, half of those were in Europe, so we're call it thirty percent. Okay. Uh, and actually, Europe drove a significant chunk of, of the business in terms of revenue. And isn't it pretty much the case for every other B two B startups? It's, I think it's pretty much the case for any startup that you build today. If you want to go for for a global company, I mean, what we, when we when we sort of uh, think about the companies we want to back, is we want to take people who have bold ideas and we want to help them go global and have to help them build global businesses. Um, and 
to us, we actually just did a, a little bit of a study through about 31 companies in our portfolio. Um, you know, for, for the ones that are truly big, global, iconic businesses, Europe is, is a huge uh, and important uh, region. Uh, we focused on businesses that start in North America and eventually migrate to Europe. Um, but it, if you think about it in sort of math terms, it really makes sense because Europe is the next GDP per capita part of the world after, after North America, right? So if you just think of it like where, where are the dollars and where are the consumers, um, that's the next biggest chunk. Um, and age obviously is coming up online uh, and is, is a vast and exciting market. Europe happens to just be very similar to North America in terms of consumer behavior and how companies buy and how s who you deploy software and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you focus on startup willing to maybe grow to Europe and you can help them doing so. Yeah, and we, we try to do it both ways. So we have a company, uh, one of our investments uh, is uh, Typeform, um, yeah. which is in, in and Spain. Them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so they um, started in Europe, but they're rapidly expanding into uh, into North America, and we're going to help them with that. Mm. Um, I'm an intercom started, obviously, in, in Dublin and uh, migrated to San Francisco. So we, we try to do it both ways. Um, it just depends on the stage. Mm. Do you see any transformation in the Silicon Valley environment through after Trump? I mean... One of the stories I, I, I remember is that right after the election, all of the founders in Silicon Valley, they were talking about politics for the first time. Even in a meeting, in a business meeting, they would take like 15 minutes to talk about how much involved they were against Trump to make sure that he wouldn't be there in four years. And it's for a startup founder in, in Silicon Valley, it's like crazy. Oh, you dedicate time to something else than your product. So it's almost like a distraction, you know? So well, I mean, this is political thing, apart from uh, any, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not taking making a point on a political point, but just this fact that they are uh, changing their, their way of working, is uh, it, it makes us believe that maybe there will be a power shift in a way, and Silicon Valley won't be the only uh, lighthouse in the innovation world, that's what I mean. Do you feel that too, or it's just... Well, I mean, a matter of time. We, we think there are great ideas being born everywhere, right? Um, uh, and by the way, congrats to the people of France for making a, making a better call yeah. in the elections. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that what you what you see is at the end of the day, in the macro, if you take a step back, and and I have, um, you know, leading up to the election, I'd spent a, b a lot of time actually in the Midwest and and parts of even California that are um, not San Francisco. Um, and uh, what you're seeing is there's this big transformation from um, most countries being kind of manufacturing oriented economies to being knowledge economies. And you see that transformation just happening if you look at the market caps of, of the top companies in the world. It's shifting from you know, oil and gas and uh, manufactured goods to technology. Yeah. So I think technology is going to be a huge part of, of the story when it comes to politics. And I think uh, it's very natural for people in Silicon Valley and everywhere, really, if they're in tech, uh, to be active. Um, I'm actually excited because, I, I, for your point, I do think people have st started taking that role more seriously. Uh, and so uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens over the next uh, four years and beyond. In terms of, you know, is the power shifting away from Silicon Valley? Um, you know, I think, as I said, I think companies can be born anywhere. What you're seeing is in, the, you know, in San Francisco, you have this virtuous uh, cycle, this virtuous ecosystem where, um, you know, if you're thinking of building a company like Dropbox and you go from 50 people to 500 people and you now need to bring in somebody who's going to be your uh, chief operating officer or your VP of marketing and they really understand that scale that you operate at, um, there are like 20 companies around you that have done that, right? They're at that scale. Um, and so what I'm excited to see is with, with Europe, as you have companies that mature, uh, mm -hmm. whether they exit through public offerings or acquisitions but become really large, is you're gonna start seeing the injection of that talent into your ecosystem. Yeah. So that when you're getting to 100 people, you have somebody who's seen 300 people. So recently I heard some rumors about IPO. <laughs> So, could you share something? Do you know uh, well, I'm more? I'm, I'm, I'm no longer at the company, but obviously I'm, I'm a shareholder, and Index Adventure is a big shareholder. Look, the, it's very exciting for Dropbox. You know, they've announced they've hit a billion of run rate, right, which is pretty spectacular. They're doing that profitably. Um, they're operating uh, across consumer and enterprise, so two, two lines of business. Uh, and I think the company is in, in great position. Now, I don't know what their 
what they're thinking. Uh, but you know, obviously, we're all hopeful and, and uh, excited. Okay. So it will happen this year. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I wish. <laughs> So my question is related more to the career change from being head of product or from the product field to VC. Um, and I wonder uh, what are the pros and cons of this switch? It's not the most obvious career shift, so yeah. Well, the, the pros are um, I get to see lots of cool companies with, with different ideas and I have no responsibility. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Realistically speaking, um, the cons are is you don't you don't get the same feeling of, of feedback, right? Like you know, if you when you invest money in a company, if, okay, Dropbox just celebrated its tenth year anniversary, right? So when you invest early in a company like that, like say you're the first round of financing, you're waiting you know seven to ten years to see what happens. So you have to wait. You have to be very patient. Um, so that's hard. Um, and you know your your day to day isn't the same as, as building and launching products. Like when you build and launch a product, you, you very quickly find out if it works or it doesn't, right? You see some metrics. If the metrics are bad, you shut it down. If the metrics are good, you improve it. With investment, you put in money and you wait. <laughs> so that's, those are the, the differences. But the, yeah, the, but the cool thing- you make a change. You, what's that? I mean, by putting money, you can participate to the potential. Totally, but, but ultimately it's not up to me to run the company. It's up to the people. So that's, I think that's the big thing is, you, is the big pitfalls of venture are you have to help people build the right team to build their business because you're not building the business for them. And you can't build, your, you can't build the business for them because you're doing it with 10 businesses. And you can't project your vision of the business onto theirs. Like it has to be really finding genuine entrepreneurs and understanding them and then helping them build a team and execute. Um, how much influence do you have as a VC on the team? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, just building credibility. So it can be a lot, right? If, you have, if you've built uh, respect and trust with a team where they see you as, as valuable and they value your opinion. Um, or if you don't do that, then you have no influence. But uh, you know, ultimately, w our job is to, um, at least the way I see my job, and because I've seen a company like Dropbox and, and Solar Junction being built in, in different stages, is to see around corners. So um, what I want to do is I want to enable you to be very effective at, at sort of achieving your vision, but also tell you what you're not seeing. A lot of that, for example, has to do with the team. So when you, you know, you might, it's back to the early question, you might have an awesome team starting today. And at some point, you'll find yourself in a situation where your first employee, you love them, has hit a ceiling. And the question is, what do you do? Because maybe they're in a critical role for the company uh, and you don't really want to move them out. You feel bad because they've been with you forever. Um, then it's my job to tell you, hey, you really have to make a hard call here. That, those are the kinds of things um, that, that is, is on me. It's not for me to invent your, your product for you. There is a rule that we try to apply and that we try to make our startup apply is up or out every six months. Either you are able to pay 20% more of the, 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 the employee, either the, you have to, to quit. That's a good one, I'm gonna use that. I, I don't <laughs> know. What is your opinion about uh, remote working and uh, startup who have a lot of uh, remote employee? Uh, from a VC point of view, is it a suitable way to work for startup? And uh, do you have any remote guy in uh, Dropbox? Yeah, so um, we actually didn't have, uh, so the question is, how do, you deal, how do you think about remote, having remote employees or um, a, a big kind of part of your team being remote? Um, actually at Dropbox, we did not do that uh, for a very long time because we really wanted to have people in one office share the culture. That was a very critical point. When we did finally do it, uh, we opened up uh, an office we, what we did in two ways. Um, first, it was on the customer support and success side, and we opened an office in Dublin. What we actually did was we took a team from Dropbox and landed them in Dublin. So they took some of the culture with them and transferred it over there. So we knew that w kind of they would transfer our values. And in fact, if you visited the Dublin office, it would feel like the Dublin version of Dropbox. It wasn't exactly the same, but it was, it was slightly modified. We ha had an even harder time doing that on engineering because engineering is you know, it's pretty critical that you have constant communication. Um, it's easier now, because you have tools like Slack and, and, and things like that. Um, 
but what we decided to do is we opened up an office in New York, uh, and we spun up our first remote engineering team there. Um, and what we did very um, specifically was we gave them a very important project. It wasn't a mission critical project, but it was a very important one, because a lot of times it's easy to have somebody remotely who's working on something that's not super important, like useful but not super important. Um, and in that case, um, it's very hard to get make them feel like they're really bought in. Um, so we did those kinds of things. In terms of when I look at companies now and, and in terms of investment, I do like personally that the team is in one place because you can really spend time. It, it cycles matter. Um, for cost reasons, a lot of times it's easier to spin up a remote team. It depends on the product you're building at the end of the day and how critical the engineering culture is to that. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. I'll make it short. Uh, the first one is about culture. Uh, you highlighted how important this is. Um, I run a company before and I find it quite hard to assess whether someone fits the culture or not just with a couple of interviews. So my question is, do you have any specific methods or tips that you'd like to share? And just maybe I'll ask the second one, it's a bit of a unusual one. My girlfriend is, has just quit her uh, job as a VC with the World Bank and she's get, looking to get in touch with some VCs in the Valley. So my question is, can I get your card and can she reach out to you? <laughs> sure, it's, uh, it's, it's Ilya, I-L-Y-A, at indexventures.com. Got it. All right. Um, so so on call, assessing culture, interviews are really hard, right? It's really hard to figure out who, who a person is in you know half an hour to an hour with them uh, in person. I'd say w we probably uh, were too constrained, like we, we would make, we're trying to make no mistakes. An easy way to do it is to obviously hire through your social graph. So, you know, even through 300 people, I think 90% of the referrals came from other people in the company. Um, um, but if you can't do that, I think it's, it's really FaceTime. Um, taking people out for a drink really sometimes <laughs> tells you one way or the other. Um, and, um, and then it's, you know, being very vigilant once you get them into the company. Uh, because the worst thing you can do is, is have somebody in who's not a culture fit uh, and prolong the pain. Um, now, culture fit doesn't mean somebody has to be exactly like you, right? They just have to share common values and, and be very effective. Ultimately, it's organizational effectiveness that, that's what you're looking for because those people will hire other people, and so you want them to kind of recursively or you know, persist this, this notion of culture and values. So, I mean, the mistake I see most people make is they bring in somebody talented, super talented, who's really good at something, but they're just not a culture fit for one reason or the other. And then it's very hard to unwind, and then it takes too long, and then everybody else around you knows that this is the case, and then they think you're a bad leader because you're not willing to make the hard call. So I think that's the situation you want to avoid, but it's really spending time with people up front. Um, it's making sure you get signal from a graph, trusted graph or social kind of group, uh, and unwinding it if you, if you see mistake. Hello, uh, quick question was, um, is a VC, I guess you've seen a lot of companies succeeding, but many more that are failing, unfortunately. And uh, my question is, what, do, what have you seen in these companies that are failing? What, what are the reasons that prevent them from uh, scaling up and succeeding eventually when they try to go to the next stage? Yeah, good question. I mean, the, the business of venture and startups is that most, most fail, right? Um, <clears throat> which is tough, actually. It's a, it's a really hard, I think one of the hardest parts of this business, there was a question of like what's hard about this business, is that um, many more companies will not succeed. And actually, when you've created a strong connection with the entrepreneur, it sucks, right? Because you're like, you're in it together. Um, the good thing is that I think the way at least, you know, tech works today is the failure is rewarded, right? So if you fail, you fail fast, and then you can do something else. And I think that's a really positive thing. It differentiates technology from most other business areas. The reasons for failure can be many. I mean, the obvious ones are market wasn't big enough. Um, your product thesis didn't really make sense. Maybe if it's super early stage, you didn't quite get to product market fit. Um, a lot of times, if you look at sort of consumer businesses, it's um, you know maybe you're flash in the pan, so people really like it, but then they don't stick around. Um, on the enterprise side, it sometimes turns out that it's really hard to sell your product, or businesses just don't want to buy in, and you spend all your money marketing to them, and then you have no money left. So there are many reasons why companies run out of money. Um, then there are company like kind of issues that are a little harder to to kind of figure out, which are team based, right? So 
you know, did you not make the right hires? Did you not make the right hires in time? Um, it, a lot of it has to do with folks here who are, you know, founders and, and leading or executives. Um, you really have to sort of make educated guesses as to when to make bold moves. Uh, and sometimes that's, that's hard because you're really kind of going out on the line. One of the companies I work with, um, you know, the, the entrepreneur, is, he's fantastic, um, but he, you know, he's, he, he really r likes to run his business um, with very low capital consumption. And so sometimes he doesn't, um, you know, get the pay up for talent, right? And that's something that we've spent time working on because if you see good talent, you're gonna p you have to pay up for it. But then it means you're running out of money. So it's like you're driving a bus, you know, full steam at a wall, <laughs> hoping you're going to clear it, right, uh, in the last second. And that's, that's the challenge of being an entrepreneur and, and building uh, companies. My question is, uh, what are some ways for founders from Europe to uh, get appointments with VCs in uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley to pitch their ideas or their startups? Second question is, um, how was the shift from academia to business and the world of startups? And do you regret it at all? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I definitely don't, re I'll answer the second question first. I definitely don't regret the shift. I, I, I did, a, uh, I wound up doing a PhD and, and, and being in science for a long time because I wanted to build uh, new things that um, ultimately have impact. Um, and I found that by doing startup type technology, uh, I could do it faster uh, and have more impact ultimately because of the way the grant system in the states works and, and generally the pace at which science moves. So I was too impatient for science, I would say. Um, so I'm in a good place. Um, in terms of how you can connect with, with US-based uh, firms, I actually think um, there's a heightened uh, interest in Europe from uh, US-based venture firms. Um, not just ones like Index that um, already have had a, a presence um, in, in Europe. Uh, because what's happening in the global landscape of venture is that there's actually a lot of money. Like it, it's never been easier to raise a venture fund. So what you're seeing is that there are lots of people who are raising lots of money to invest in startups, and they're looking for opportunities. Uh, and tech in Silicon Valley is very competitive, so they're looking for the next place where there is a big enough market, which is Europe. Um, and in terms of how to connect, it's always best to connect through introductions. Right, it's the same as hiring. It's always best to go through um, a referral uh, because ultimately our job is to try to as quickly as possible say no so that we can spend time focusing on places where we can say yes. Um, and so I think that's one. Uh, whether it's, um, you know, the best referrals are, frankly, to me, other entrepreneurs. Um, if, some, if a VC sends me a deal, you know, I kind of have to wonder, like, Am I the first one to be sent this deal? Is this a good deal? I'm not sure. Uh, but if it's an entrepreneur who vouches for, for another entrepreneur, I think that's really impactful. So I would s encourage you guys to build a network of folks who have, if you want to connect with USBCs, have US-based investors. Um, and then you know, there's always kind of um, direct, direct outbound or, or the investor that you have that might be able to connect you. And ultimately, you can always do in, you know, kind of um, incubator type things and, uh, and find ways to do it or you know, just build, build amazing products, put them on Product Hunt, and, and people will find you. So many different ways, but I'd say if you can leverage a network to make the connection, that's probably the best. Uh, thanks for sharing this. Uh, I, I have a background in uh, IB, uh, M&A, a few IPOs, and I, I'd like to move into the, the PE world and, and maybe the VC world. But um, so my, my question is about valuation. Um, I've spent a lot of time on, on valuation, uh, but, but for mature companies, and I'd like to, to see how you approach valuation, whether it's a, a, a big part of your discussions or not. And uh, in France, you, you often hear VCs saying, well, it's easy. It's 20, 30% dilution versus the previous round. So happy to, to hear you on this. Yeah, it's a, I mean, valuation is something we probably spend an inordinate amount of time talking about. And valuation is different between stages. And certainly at the late stage, uh, when you already have uh, a business that you can look at metrics, you can look at public market comparables or uh, M&A comparables, it's pretty easy to, to sort of peg a what you think is a reasonable valuation. At the early stage, when there's nothing, um, it's very hard. Uh, and at both stages, more so at the early stage than the, the late stage, it becomes a market. 
You're, you're worth whatever somebody's willing to pay. Uh, and uh, what I see good entrepreneurs do is they drum up enough interest um, to where they can get the valuation that they want and the dilution that they want. Um, and then they use that to find the investor that they want. Um, so maybe they won't take uh, the highest valuation because you know it's a great investor, but they already they've anchored uh, at some point where it's reasonable. Um, so it's it's really you know that's at least the dynamic on, on in Silicon Valley is such that there's a market, uh, and you typically have a bunch of bidders, uh, and you know it winds up being in the what you would call reasonable ranges, and sometimes it's unreasonable, uh, but um, ultimately it's how much you believe you're you're going to be able to. Um, to gain through in the investment and, and how much uh, somebody else is, is willing to pay. Hello, thank you for sharing your ideas. Um, if you had the choice between, um, if you like go out from school and you had the choice to enter into a venture capital or to enter a startup, um, what would you choose if you want to launch a company? Because venture is like a compact experience from a lot of startups of startups and being in a startup is like really living the experience of a startup. Yeah, I definitely go to a startup and, and I go to a startup and think about it maybe in two ways. One way is you can go to a startup that's a little bit more mature because t let's take a step back. W what do you need to start a company? You need, and I, well, you need to want to start a company, like you, you need to really want it. Um, you need an idea and you need a, a team. Uh, and frankly, sometimes you can start with a team and figure out the idea. Uh, and you're, you're not going to find a, a team to start a company with in a venture capital firm. Not even across three venture capital firms, because you're all going to want to be CEOs. Um, and so the best bet for building that team is to go to a company. Um, and then you can sort of debate whether you want to go to an earlier stage company or a later stage company. Um, later stage is nice because you have um, more people around you, uh, it's, you can sort of be hands-on, do a pretty well-defined set of work, and have some some time to figure things out. I personally have erred uh, in my career in going to companies that are um, early in the sense that their traction or where they are as a business far outpaces the size of the team and the capability of the team, because then you have to do a lot, so you have to learn really fast. Um, and so both, it just depends on what you like to do. Both can be viable choices, but I would absolutely go to a startup, not a VC firm out of school. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your all your expertise. Um, I have the ambition to build a company uh, within the mobile apps, and my question is now, from going from the idea part to the uh, building the product and then raising the the funding to to build it, what would you say is the most critical part for all the companies that you've seen that failed to build it? They focus too much into building the product and then went too late into getting the founding, or they started too early trying to get the founding without even having a product ready. What would, you, what would be your advice on to that? Um, well, I think you, you, the way you want to think about this, and I think it, at the early stage it very much aligns with how we think about it, is um, you, want to, you want to continuously eliminate risk. So at this stage where you have an idea and you want to build something, you want to figure out if people will like it. Like people use it. So you want to try to build it as quickly as possible to get some data around that. Now the question is, can you do it without, do you need to raise money to even do that? Um, if the answer is yes, then absolutely you have to go raise money. Um, if the answer is no, um, then, you know, I'd encourage, or little money, I'd encourage you to really figure out what's the smallest thing you can build that people will be excited about using. Don't overbuild it. That's, the, that's a failure mode that we see a lot where people really think they know what customers want and they build a lot of stuff and then they run out of money and then they haven't built the thing that people actually want. But build, figure out if people are actually using your product and like it and then go, go raise money based on that data because you've eliminated one of the biggest risks. What are the, um, the trends that uh, you're currently funding at in this venture? And my second one is what do you think about uh, virtual reality? Well, virtual reality is very cool. Um, it, it's no, it's like it, it's. I, I mean, the reason I think you see so much talk about it is that. Um, well, how many of you have tried virtual reality in some form? Form, like the experience is magical, right? You put it on, you're like, wow, this is crazy. Of course, everybody's going to do this. There's no reason they wouldn't. Um, and so I think that's why there's so much excitement about VR. 
I'm excited about, about VR. From an investment perspective, um, I think it's still very early days because um, you know the consumer side of it where you, you need a lot of hardware out there in people's hands um, is still early. Uh, and so um, we have to wait for penetration of that for the application uh, side of the world to, to be investable. And on the business side, whether it's you know doctors or uh, mechanics or ex exploration of some kind or uh, simulation or even financial services where you can have Excel spreadsheets and four dimensions. Um, you know, I think that we're seeing some interesting things uh, there. The question always becomes is, is it a big enough uh, market opportunity? But certainly some form of VR and AR will be prevalent. Uh, it's just a question of time. So we, we watch the space very closely. And um, at Index, we have a lot of investments in games. Uh, in gaming companies. In fact, we just invested in a really cool company called uh, Roblox, which is um, kind of like Minecraft. Uh, and you know, th those kinds of companies, I think, will have a really interesting shot at, at being VR and playing in the VR space. Um, and just in terms of, the, I think the first question was, what are the trends? Uh, we, we, we invest in, in a few core categories, um, consumer, uh, especially marketplaces and games, uh, fintech, financial services, and kind of the transformation of financial services. Um, enterprise, both kind of deep infrastructure like um, Algolia uh, or more productivity like Slack and, and Dropbox. Um, and uh, we keep an eye on things like digital and, and consumer health. Um, those are the, the core areas and we think that in, in all of them there's still a lot of uh, cool stuff to be built. Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.